Hi, this is Ms. Wiles, and it sounds like we're here on the runway at the Fayetteville Regional Airport um, because of the charger going in the back in the background. But here we are, and today we're going to talk about complex numbers. And complex numbers are numbers that are in this form, A plus B I. A plus B I. Now, A and B are any kind of real number. And I is a designator for an imaginary number. Now, imaginary number was only invented or come up with so that we could deal with things like the square root of negative 4. Prior to the invention or discovery of complex numbers, the square root of negative 4 had no value. Now, we should recall that the square root of 4 is equal to 2 because it is a perfect square. I could make a square out of four blocks on the floor. Also, other perfect squares that you should recall are the square root of nine. So nine is a perfect square. The square root of 16, 16 is a perfect square. The square root of 25. Continue that list up to the square root of 121. Yeah, All right, and we're back. The power of the pause button worked whenever it was pushed correctly. It didn't work originally. So you see that we have um, expanded our list of perfect squares, and I've given you an, a visual here as to why a particular value is known as a perfect square and how we find the square root. The square root of a square is the length of its side. And the square of a square is the two sides multiplied by each other, the area of the square. Now, because we needed something to deal with needed is kind of a loose term, because we wanted something, somebody wanted something to deal with the square root of negative 4, because it's not just negative, it's, we don't really have a visual for what a, a box a square that had negative 2 on each side, even if it had negative 2 on each side, negative times negative is positive. And so we really didn't have a value that we could multiply times itself and get negative 4. So they came up with this value and they called it i. Now i equals the square root of negative 1. So anytime I see a, a negative value in the radicand of a radical expression, I know that I have a complex number, an imaginary number, whenever I'm simplifying it, because the simplifying rules say that I can't leave a negative sign under the radical sign. So when I um, simplify this expression, I get 2i. If I were to simplify the square root of negative 9, that would be 3i. If I simplify, for example, the square root of negative 100, that would be 10i. Now, i in itself, just we have exponents to i equals i. Everyone can agree that somebody says that, and you're like, okay. i equals square root of negative 1, which equals i. Now, i squared equals something. i cubed equals something. i to the fourth equals something. And the way that I remember what it equals is I say to myself, I1, I1 with negatives in the middle. I1, I1 with negatives in the middle. Now let's take this. We're going to go to the next screen. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. Now, I do want to show you why these values are true. Um, I is I is easy enough to see, but I is also the square root of negative 1. Well, I squared is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. There's a rule that says that if I'm squaring, if I'm multiplying two squares that are exactly the same, then it equals 
whatever I have here, that negative 1. The square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 is equal to square root of negative, or is equal to negative 1. Just like, for example, the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is 3. And then if I have i cubed, it's the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which is negative 1 because of this part, times the square root of negative 1. And what is the square root of negative 1? Well, it's i. So it's just negative i. That's where that value comes from. i to the fourth is i squared times i squared. And i squared is negative 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Now don't worry. You don't have to memorize this because your handy dandy calculator will tell you this. Go ahead and take your handy dandy calculator. Hey, on your handy dandy calculator, clear it completely with second plus seven, one, and two. Clear the RAM. The reason I'm asking you to clear the RAM is because there's something that you have to do to tell the calculator to work with these imaginary numbers. You need to go into mode. Go into the calculator mode and arrow down until you see the line that says real. And then beside real it has A plus BI. And then it has something else. But scroll down to that point and highlight the A plus BI. Press enter and then quit that screen because now your calculator is going to work with imaginary numbers. And once your calculator is ready, your calculator will do a lot of things with imaginary numbers. And so we're going to talk about the things that it will do and we'll probably have to pause here and there. If you need me to pause in the class, just raise your hand and I'll pause. If you put I into the calculator right now and press enter, by the way, you might be looking for I. Well, notice how I draw the eye. It's a cute little eye. And if you look at the face of your calculator, you can find it. It's the second function of the decimal sign. If you look down there at the decimal, you'll see a little blue eye right above the decimal. And that means that you have to go second decimal, and it'll type a little eye on your screen. And if you do that and you press enter, it'll show you that you have an eye. Well, then if you press, if you type in I squared, if you type in I squared, it will show you that that quantity is negative 1. You put in i cubed. It will show you that that quantity is negative i. And if you put in i to the fourth, it will show you that that quantity is 1. Now that's, it might go a little bit further than that. I haven't played with it too much. But it will not give you something that means a lot if you see i to the 27. If you put in i to the 27th, you're going to get this value. It looks like a very small number, but it's got a lot of de uh, digits in it, like point negative 3e to the negative 13 minus i. And that's a, a, that is a very, very small number. It's a decimal with like 12 zeros and then a 3 after the decimal, so it's an extremely small number close to zero. But it doesn't tell you what this equals, because there is a value that this equals. But this little pattern here holds true for every four i's that we have. So like i to the fifth is the same value as i. i to the sixth is the same value as negative one i to the seventh is the same value as i cubed. i to the eighth is the same value as i to the fourth. With that logic, that means that every multiple of four in the exponent is going to give me a value of one. So i to the eighth, i to the twelfth, i to the sixteenth, i to the twentieth, all of those. With that logic, then i to the eleventh would give me negative i, and i to the tenth would give me negative 1. And i to the ninth will give me i, because it follows a pattern. Every 4, it's going to run through this iteration, this repeating pattern, again. Now, so how can you deal with that as a student 
is you can take this 27, whatever the exponent is, take your exponent and divide it by 4. Take your exponent and divide it by 4. When you take your exponent and divide it by 4, let me move this over. When you have your exponent and you divide by 4, you're going to get some number and then sometimes you'll have a decimal. Sometimes you'll have a 0.25. Sometimes you'll have a 0.5. Sometimes you'll have a 0.75, and sometimes you won't have a decimal at all. You'll just have a whole number. Now, following the logic of what we see happening here, if I don't have a decimal after the, I do this division by 4, then that matches up to this one. Because 20 divided by 4 is 5, 16 divided by 4 is 4, 4 divided by 4 is 1. I've got no decimal part. I have nothing left over. It's perfect. So it fits into this category. If I have 0.75 left, that means that I had three extras, I had th a remainder of three. So it would show up here. Now, when you did the exponent divided by 4, what did you get? When you did 27 divided by 4, you got... 6.75. That means that when it was 24, when it was i to the 24th, it was here. And then it went i to the 25th, i to the 26th, and i to the 27th. So if your decimal part of your answer after you do this division is 0.75, your answer is negative i. If your decimal part is 0.5, your answer is negative 1. And if your decimal part when you divide is 0.25, then your answer is i. So let's do another example. We'll do this one in red. What if I had i to the 417th power? i to the 417th power. How would I handle that? What would I do? I take the 417 and divide it by 4. And I should get 104.25. What does that tell me about what i to the 417 power is? That it's i. Because of the 0.25. i to the 900 and 11. I to the 911th power. You don't want to make a list for that one, do you? You want to figure out what's going on. You know, it's happening every four. So you divide that 911 by four, and you get 227.75. You like how I can do that? I didn't pick that number before y'all came to class. I'm imagining myself dividing it out on the little whiteboard that's in my head. Don't you wish you had a whiteboard in your head? And so since that was 227.75, then I to the 911th power equals negative I. And apparently I like to pick things that are really close to a multiple of four, but not quite. Okay, if it's a multiple of four, then that's going to, it's still going to work because you're going to get an answer that has no decimal part. So this is the part to remember. That if your answer has a 0.25 when you do that division, the exponent divided by four, then it's i. And if it's 0.5, it's negative one, and then negative i, and then one. Okay, this video will help you do IXL Algebra 2 H8. And that's all I have to say about that.